On July 19th, I released a 13-minute video on my first four hours of Elden Ring. On July 27th, I beat the final boss after 58 more hours. Matt says I now need to release a video 188 and a half minutes long, but because I would never do that to my editor, I've condensed the entire run down into a mere 30 minutes. And because for a game of this size, that's not a lot of time, I'm gonna get started. Uh, really quick, Bob from the future here. Uh, you'll notice the video is not 30 minutes. Uh, that's because I made that video, and it was bad, so I made this one instead. And I didn't want to redo the intro and thumbnail and stuff, so uh, I totally lied. But you're not allowed to be mad, it's extra content. Enjoy. Quick recap for those of you who didn't see the other video, which you should. I did the tutorial, beat the tree sentinel, got a horse, and then spent three straight hours fighting Market. This is objectively too long, but instead of taking advantage of the game's beautifully designed open world that lets you gain strength through exploration before challenging the main questline, I challenged the main questline and headed straight past Margaret's arena to Stormvale Castle. Well, not straight away. First, I got some help from our concerned video game friend Melania, who brought us to the Round Table Hold, where I can upgrade my weapons, and from a concerned real-life friend who told me that two-handing weapons was a thing and I am eternally in his debt. After that, though, I headed to the castle. Oh, and the horse Melania gave to us is named Torn, and I learned that he can double jump because magic or something. But after that, I headed to the castle. Stormvale was not designed with people in mind. It was designed with birds in mind, and that means a lot of balancing along roof edges, climbing up way too tall ladders, and fighting the armies of incredibly well-equipped birds that litter the area. These avian enemies have knives on their feet, or flamethrowers on their beaks, or dangerously explosive barrels that they throw directly at your face with no hesitation. They're far from the only enemies, though. The castle has plenty of people, and people adjacent horrible monstrosities, and living pots who I've been assured have some horribly sad lore, but I have no time for that because ooh look the boss. Godric the Grafted is a guy who thought prosthetics were really neat, and despite still having all his limbs, insists on wearing as many as possible. Also, prosthetics haven't been invented yet, so he just stole people's arms. And legs. And one specific finger that he really wanted for some reason. Naturally, having over 20 limbs lets him hit over 20 times harder than me, cause earthquakes by striking the ground, and also use scary tornado magic. I'm not gonna spend too long on this fight, mostly because I'm on a horribly strict self-imposed time limit, but also because there's just not that much to it. The most entertaining part of the first phase is how you can jump over his shockwave attack. The most entertaining part of the second phase is the massive dragon head he fuses to his arm that, despite being freshly removed from the rest of the dragon, can definitely still breathe fire. And mess up his hitboxes a bit, so annoying stuff like this happens, but before too long, a second major boss was down, and I had a nice new pair of wolverine claws to slice stuff up with. But also, I'm sorry, did, did you see Did you see that? that? The hitbox? That was, that was dumb. That was dumb. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, moving on. Despite the head of the castle recently joining the deceased, Stormvale is still business as usual, and that means I die to more birds. But there are still secrets to discover, enemies to fight, and creepy crafted monsters running through the hallways that I need to run in the exact opposite direction of. My escape brought me to the sewers where there are rats. Very large rats with very large teeth, but my claws are super helpful for dealing with them because of my favorite status effect in the game, Bleed. This is a gross oversimplification, but basically hitting an enemy a bunch makes them lose a lot of health. And blood. Or what I assume is sap, in the case of this massive tree monster thing that also lives in the sewers. It's big, it's scary, it explodes with fiery blasts of holy light, but it doesn't hold a candle to a tiny old man with stabby hands. Guarded by the tree thing is what I'm being told is also a tree? That bleeds? And clearly has a face? Listen, if you want an explanation for the weird flesh wood thing, go watch a lore video. I've got no clue what's going on in the story here. I probably missed half of it, to be honest. I only saw this lady, whose name is totally, definitely Reyna one time, and the only thing I know about apparently community famous patches is that I should have killed him when I had the chance. Okay, rapid fire. I ran away from a line with a sword, got some giant stone golems to shoot one another for fun, and put a bug on my head that makes me take more damage, but it's funny, so I don't care. I found some weird dead fingers on top of a tower that let me activate Godric's Great Rune, which I never used, and leveled up enough to equip the spear from the Tree Sentinel, which I used to fight an old necromancer lady in a boat. And then I talked to this dude who sent me to hell. Welcome to Kaelid, the best travel destination if you're looking for fires, monsters, and way too many dragons. I'm not supposed to be here yet. The spear I was so happy to use is next to useless against most of the enemies, and even the smallest foe can do massive amounts of damage. Even the one safe area where this giant dogman traded me a stick for an eyeball has a massive guard outside who decided leaving wasn't allowed. Nothing more clearly communicated the hostility of the area, though, than the massive dragon guarding the bridge to the rest of the zone. Being, well, a massive dragon, he's not the hardest target to hit, but he only has to land one hit to finish me off, while I have to land, by my calculations, about a billion and one. Well, definitely possible, it wasn't possible for me, and I would have gladly taken the opportunity to run away if it weren't for one specific mechanic that seemed made for this exact situation. Remember the whole bleed thing I talked about earlier? Well, bleed doesn't just do a lot of damage, it deals percent damage. 10.5% damage, if the wiki is to be believed, meaning no matter how underpowered the claws themselves are, the bleed they proc will always be helpful. 
Don't get me wrong, it doesn't make the fight easy, triggering the effect eight times without getting hit once took more tries than I'm willing to admit in a public setting, but the reward was, well, maybe not worth it. That took a really long time, but it was definitely super helpful. Killing the dragon gave me a lot of XP, sure, but it was nothing compared to what I got from the massive dragon on the other side of the bridge. This guy had a massive health bar to match his general massiveness, and a bunch of dragons patrolling his front to stop you from killing him. Around his back, though, there is nothing to stop me from slowly building up bleed after bleed until he's down, and I've received a full 16 levels worth of experience. Now, for those unfamiliar with leveling in this game, you can dump XP, or runes, or souls, or whatever you want to call them, into any of these eight stats, which buff either your damage, health, stamina, or general wizard nonsense. Of the eight, vitality is arguably the most important, giving you the extra health you need to not get one shot by 90% of the attacks in the game. Endurance is also a must-have, letting you run further, swing your sword more often, and equip heavier armor to not get one-shot by 90% of the attacks in the game. However, I like it when big number go burr, so all of this dragon XP was dumped directly into strength, and I've never regretted this decision. Ever. Dragons aren't the only threat in Kaled, though. Everything hurts here. And a lot of it flies, too. These bats guarding half a weird amulet caused problems, these massive bird things caused significantly more problems, and this castle was defended by catapults that launched flying fiery balls of problem directly into my face. The castle also has a bunch of tiny guards with tinier fire-throwing turrets, and a very big guard with a very on-fire sword guarding the very closed front gate. Fortunately, our horse has the ability to double jump for some reason, so after a quick trip around the back, I was officially inside Redmain Castle. Also inside Redmain Castle are these scary Iron Maiden nightmare machines, more lions with swords on their arms, and this path full of death and sadness. But most importantly, there's a boss. Or, well, two bosses, technically, the Misbegotten Warrior and the Crucible Knight, and they ended up being the most difficult fight in my entire playthrough. The Warrior had attacks I found incredibly difficult to dodge, and hardly gave me any time to punish when he missed. While not every attack was a one-hit KO, he was very good at stopping my attempts to heal, and all the random clutter littered throughout the arena made running away very difficult. Well, that and the entire second boss I had to deal with. The Crucible Knight was nowhere near as dangerous, with rather slow, predictable attacks, but it doesn't matter how easy to dodge an attack is if you don't see it coming. Oh, and he's also immune to bleed, which means it took ages to kill him. And he has a stomp attack that you should really roll towards him to avoid, but it's kind of hard to see and I messed it up a lot. And he has a second phase where he grows wings and a tail and just, oh my god. Full admission, I tried everything to make this fight easier for me. I upgraded my weapons, put on my best armor, I even used summons for the one and only time hoping they would help distract the Crucible Knight for at least a moment while I dealt with the warrior. I can't point to one specific part of the fight as the reason it was so difficult, nothing was impossible to deal with, but needing to play mistake-free for such an extended period of time was a challenge that took a ton of repetition to get down. Hours of repetition, so many that I completely ran out of storage space and the recording cut off before the end of the fight. So I don't actually have any footage to put at the end here of me winning. Like, I'm just, I'm just fighting him, and then it cuts off. So, yeah, just trust I beat him. Cool? Cool. This was not worth it. Yeah, sure, I got a few levels, which I put directly into strength, and a cool sword that required me to put many more levels into strength, but past the arena? All I found was this old man who told me that some really cool stuff is going to happen, just not now, and I should totally leave and come back later. So I did. I wandered around the starting area I'd completely skipped over at the beginning of the game, I found a couple massive bears, fought a bloodhound in a magic arena surrounded by these lovely little rockworm thingies, and found the second half of the amulet that operates an elevator. Somewhere. I don't know where, we'll figure it out later. I made my way through an entire castle of many misbegotten warriors, as well as a full-sized one that proved much easier to handle without the Crucible Knight backing it up. This one dropped another massive sword made of other swords that I instantly started using because it's just cool, but it was also heavy, meaning I had to unequip all my armor just to be light enough to use it comfortably. On one hand, that made me incredibly easy to kill, but on the other, I was now playing as an old man in his pajamas beating things up with a 20-foot sword, and that's exactly what I want to do when I retire. The claws are technically better, though. I've been able to upgrade them a decent amount more as they use normal smithing stones instead of the special somber smithing stones that I still hadn't found the most common tier of, but I'm sure I'll find one soon. Back on the road past Godric's castle, we find, well, a lot of things. A bunch of creepy skeletons, spooky spirits, a massive lobster, and a knight that only shows up at night and should 100% have been called the Night Knight, and you 100% agree with me. Past the Halloween section, though, we find the entrance to Hogwarts, the entrance to the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, where all the wizards go to learn magic, and I go to prove that the pen is, in fact, much weaker than the sword in combat to the death. But not yet, because they've locked the door for some strange reason, and the key is guarded by a dragon. A magic-using dragon, and even though I'm not 100% sure how they taught the massive flying lizard to shoot magic lasers, I know he's nowhere near as dangerous as what I fought in Kaled, so it wasn't long before he was dead and I had my key. These random flowers, who also somehow know magic, however, are much worse than anything I saw in Kaled and are probably the most dangerous enemy in the game. I never would have made this video if they were a mandatory fight, I'd still be trying to beat them. 
unsuccessfully. Why do the plants know magic? This is unfair. Ignoring the incredibly angry flora of the region, though, I headed into the college, where I proved that the sword is, in fact, much mightier than the pen- Oh, sorry, I made that joke already. Uh, arriving in Hogwarts- Why is writing so hard? So the academy has, well, an interesting design for a school. At the entrance is an entire graveyard full of the freshly undead, which is quite morbid and deficient. The walkways are designed quite poorly, with massive balls rolling down the stairways in an elevator that is definitely not OSHA approved, and the pet policy is a little lax, as someone brought in their 30-foot magic sword-wielding wolf friend, and he is a little aggressive towards strangers. To be fair though, so are all the students. Not a single member of the school so much as asked me for my student number before opening fire with a barrage of little blue magic bolts. Fortunately, I proved that the pen is, in fact, much weaker than the- As much as I'd like to bring you through to the end of the Academy, Elden Ring had other ideas. My experience with this game was almost entirely glitch-free, but this one time it decided that the ground wasn't real and I spawned in dead. Now, this normally wouldn't be much of a problem, but when you die, you drop all your XP at your place of death. Now, I didn't have a lot of XP on me, and given I'd fallen through the map, my grave was nowhere to be seen, but I'm incredibly petty and the compass at least told me what direction it was in. So I left the college and started heading north, where I finally found that one elevator the medallion was for. Neat. So the Atlas Plateau is, I'm sorry for repeating, not somewhere I'm supposed to be yet. Even these basic zombie enemies almost kill me in a single hit, and this wizard fighting alongside them has ridiculous amounts of health for what I assume is just a guy in robes. Nevertheless, I traveled across the whole thing, from south to north, knowing that a single death would mean my runes, wherever they were, would be lost forever. I ran away from several enemies, met up with a, well, not a friend, he just kind of points forever. Waiting. And then I got to the end, and they weren't there. Uh, my runes weren't there, so, uh, yeah. Back to college! The footage I've been showing has been going back and forth between the Wolverine Claws and the Massive Sword this whole time, and that's because, while the Claws are objectively stronger, the Big Sword is objectively bigger and cooler in every way. However, uh, game hard, and I don't have the patience to do everything in the least optimal way possible, just most things. Anyway, I'm sure the Big Sword will get a lot better once I find a Tier 1 Somber Smithing Stone, right? Like, I already have Tier 2, and 3, and 4? Ones? I've got to get a tier one eventually. Yeah, uh, but for now, uh, it's not completely useless. The big sword does big stagger damage, meaning humanoid enemies like this night guy don't stand a chance against it. Also, he parried my claws when I tried to use them, and that hurt my feelings. And my gut. But past that lies the final boss and head of this academy, Renala. Her fight is weird. She just kind of floats in the air while her, uh, children, student things throw books and fire and furniture at me until I stab enough of them to take down Renala's shield. Then I stab Renala until she dies, and by dies I mean enters phase 2, because no good wizard college has a headmaster who doesn't shoot giant wizard lasers. And smaller wizard lasers. And the moon, but the most dangerous part of this phase isn't Renala herself, but the spirit she summons. The wolves pursue you relentlessly, stopping you from focusing on the boss, the giant kills you, and the dragon super kills you. Fortunately, Renala herself doesn't have the most health, so I found the most success by simply ignoring the massive dragon she summoned and taking her out from close range, where she couldn't land her lasers. So, another boss down, and I'm one step closer to beating the game. Probably. See, one of the side effects of not learning the lore is that I have no clue what I'm doing here. I've just been wandering around in circles until something tries to kill me, and I kill it back. Now though, a guy named Gideon has shown up at the round table hold, and he has a nice little list of a bunch of dangerous people and their home addresses. Godric and Renala I've already dealt with, Radon will probably show up at the Radon Festival at that one castle in Caitlyn, whenever that is, Morgoth's in the capital, and Rykard is back at the Altus Plateau. Because I don't know when Radon's showing up, and the two fingers don't want me going into the capital, whatever that means, it's time to head back to the plateau and enter the Volcano Manor. Or at least I'd like to, but last time I tried, the plateau kind of kicked my butt. Fortunately, I've leveled up enough to use that giant sword I got from the hardest fight in this game, and it is awesome. Apologies to the finger lady. Using my great new sword, and also the claws because bleed is still broken, I found a village of crazy old ladies, beat up a man who used the power of evil god to become a noodle and who will be back later, and learned that having a weapon that deals a lot of damage doesn't entirely make up for having no health. I get two shot by the simple dog enemies, not to mention the giant rod powered iron maiden machines, or the massive skeleton summoned by a ghost boatman who doesn't have the best grasp on the relationship between boats and water. But at the very least, it's all doable. I just have to not get hit. Ever. Elden Ring is a game where you get hit a lot, especially in caves. I haven't talked much about caves, since I haven't really gone into any, but the Patches guy from earlier shoved me off a cliff directly onto the entrance of one, which sucked because it took me a really long time to climb that cliff, and also because the cave was full of these horrible poison slime monsters that, surprise surprise, one-shot me. It also had these two bug guys at the end who fired out these projectile attacks, which one-shot me. This was the easy cave. The hard cave had these things. 
Gelmir Hero's Cave is the name of an area permanently etched into my nightmares, and it's all because of these flame chariots. They kill you the moment you touch them and charge up and down the skeleton-populated lava-filled nightmare hallway, crushing allies and enemies alike. Timing, patience, and the ability to deal with skeletons in way too close quarters combat are all required to make it to the end of the hallway, and what do you find on the other side? More hallway. I said that the Misbegotten Warrior and Crucible Knight were the hardest boss fight in this game, but the hardest area was definitely this cave. I ended up googling how to skip most of it, and it still took way too long. I'd like to think I'm a smart person, but I don't know if I'd ever forget how I was supposed to ride this chariot over the lava. But after finally making my way through and beating the Wolf Wizard, who's also here, I guess, do you know what I earned? A summon I can't use, and a death root I traded to the Beast Clergyman and Caelid for a spell that rotted forever in my inventory, because this man is not a wizard. But if I've now completed the hardest fight in the game and the hardest area, surely the remainder is going to be piece of cake, yeah? Nope, because while the dual boss may have been the hardest standard fight, the full-grown falling star beast is the hardest horse fight. Okay, no, sorry, that's a dumb distinction to make. Horse fights are normal fights too. I just lied. For fun. Speaking of fun, the hours I spent on this fight were... Well, some of them were fun. Most of them were me riding in circles until the boss threw rocks at me. Honestly, that was where most of my deaths came from. Avoiding this attack was really hard, and it's not like I could just melt his health bar before he used it, because, well... You know, unupgraded weapon, no level 1 summer smithing stones, you get it by now. It was a cool fight though, I liked the lightning and the lasers and how if you hit his head a bunch he fell over and you gotta hit his eye, but objectively the most important part was the weapon he dropped. Or more accurately, the weapon I ripped off his face. It's big, it's magical, it shoots lightning, but most importantly, I need to completely reallocate my stats to use it. Fortunately, Ranala, who is surprisingly chill with me for someone whose children I violently murdered earlier, does exactly that. After handing over a larval tear I got from a man who turned into a bear who turned into a dead bear, I got to completely rework where I put my levels. As much as it hurt me to do, I had to lose a bit of strength, but the extra health, stamina, and carrying capacity were well worth the reduced damage. It also meant I didn't have to run around in my pajamas with a bearded, crystally rock on my head. I'll leave it up to you whether that's a good thing or not. So, after a quick trip through hand land, I finally entered Volcano Manor, where the prey to Rikard, one of my targets, is supposedly waiting. Instead of meeting up with him though, I found one of his attendants, who decided someone attempting to assassinate their leader was a perfect candidate for recruitment. So I joined up with him. Now, if you weren't tipped off by all the lava, spooky dungeon area, or the fact that I look like this while going on missions for them, these are the bad guys. Like, they say it themselves, their whole thing is killing all the tarnish. Uh, for people who don't know, that's just about everyone in the round table hold, uh, just about everyone in Volcano Manor, and, uh, me. So, it's a bit of an odd mission statement, but supposedly this gets me to Rikard, so that's all I'm here for. The people at the round table don't seem to care, for some reason, so I headed out and started taking out Tarnished. This honestly wasn't that hard. It seems to me that a giant sword is really the way to go in fighting human enemies. Being able to stagger them while they're in the middle of their attacks does wonders for me and my embarrassingly small health bar. Uh, now, these people are probably innocent, uh, again, working for the bad guys, but I'm a tarnished and I respawn, so they probably uh, do that. I mean, I never see them again, but like, you know, a uh, uh, big world. Uh, look at this cool snake guy with a weird stretchy finger candelabra. That's really cool. Don't pay attention to my murder spree. Regardless, the next target is off in the capital, and on the way there, I meet up with a familiar face. Margit's back, just like he told me he would be, or at least I think he told me, not gonna lie, I struggled to parse this one, but it's still great to see him again. After all, I made an entire video on him in his fight, and I'm super familiar with his work, so I should have no problem beating him now that I'm so much stronger, right? Okay, uh, turns out he's still a major boss, and I still don't have all that much health, but at the very least it took way fewer tries than the first attempt, and he's definitely dead now. Definitely. Just like the Tree Sentinel from the beginning, I killed him- Oh wait, nope, there are two more of him now, actually. But now I have a horse, so the fight's way easier. So much simpler. This took so many tries. I have never run away from a boss in this game. Every boss I've seen has died before I've left the zone, and it has caused me so many problems, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna force my way through the main story without taking a detour when things get too tough. So after finally beating this Tree Sentinel fight, I took the best detour in this game. Enough time has passed, and the Radon Festival has started, which means it's time to team up with a wolf man, a bunch of random people I've never met, and a giant walking pot man named Alexander the Warrior, who I love deeply, to take out one of the coolest bosses in the entire game. Star Scourge Radon is not okay. Because of lore reasons, his brain is rotted away, and he patrols the wastelands of Caelid on his trusty steed, which does not look like it should be able to hold his weight, but it's fine, because magic, probably. Despite missing large chunks of his prefrontal cortex and also all of the other cortexes, he still definitely knows how to fight, firing endless barrages of way too big arrows, using his purple gravity magic to make things explode, because that's how gravity works, and doing whatever this is. Rest in peace, Alexander, you will be missed. Speaking of Alexander, he's here! Or was here, along with all the other warriors from earlier. I haven't talked about Elden Ring's summoning system because I haven't been using it, with one exception that went very poorly, but I gladly use them for this fight. If you weren't clued in by the whole festival where everyone gets together to fight Radon thing, you're supposed to get everyone together to fight Radon. 
This makes the fight about 500 times easier, but it's cool, so I did it anyways. This does mean that it only lasted 4 attempts though, and the Star Scourge fell with, honestly, not that much effort. You might be wondering about that name, actually, Star Scourge. I thought it was just a super fancy title that the devs thought sounded cool, but FromSoft doesn't really do that. Godric the Grafted is called that because of all the grafting, Margit is the Fell Omen because he's spooky, and Radon is the Star Scourge because he's been fighting a star this whole time. And now that he's dead... Okay, never mind. Apparently he was fighting like 500 stars, and now one of them has made a very big hole in the ground that I was very interested in exploring. Unfortunately, I didn't find anything interesting. I fought interesting things like a dragonkin, another wizard wolf, and uh, me. But aside from what is admittedly a pretty great view, I didn't really find anything down here. I did put on a new hat though, that's something. For more somethings, we return to the main story, where we have more horse fights to get to. I really appreciate how Torrent adds to the combat in this game. In most fights, you avoid damage by rolling, early or late, in or out, or perpendicularly, it's all about the roll. Horses cannot roll, and there's no proper replacement for it either. I don't think there's a single way to gain iframes while on your horse. If someone's setting an attack your way, you have to actually get out of the way, not just do a little flip half a second before Crimson Lightning removes all your bones. You have the tools to help with this, of course, the dodging, not the bone removal. Uh, Torrent is fast, has a double jump, and gives you access to attacks that are really good at staggering an enemy while not leaving you horribly vulnerable while you charge them. For this fight, no, oh, um, we're fighting the Draconic Knight, by the way, uh, he's got a horse that breathes fire, blah blah. You've even got to get off the horse every now and then, because lightning from the sky is faster than a horse, and this isn't Sekiro where jumping stops you from getting electrocuted. But other than that, this is a good horse fight. My horse is better than his horse, so I win and I make my way to the capital city of Lindell. Upon reaching the capital, Melania tells me she's leaving to go somewhere else, which probably isn't that important since I forgot she was even following us, and I started making my way through the city. Lindell is a weird city, where half the people here are these strange little trumpet plank snowman things, a dragon died in the middle of it, no one felt like cleaning it up, and I started to realize I really needed to find that level 1 smithing stone to upgrade my weapon. I have found smithing stones for the second upgrade, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, but without the first, my crazy monster fang sword is going to stay the same, while the enemy health bars get bigger and bigger. For a great example, look at this volcano manor assassination I performed in the city. These fights are supposed to be about the same as a fight against another player, but with my current weapon, it takes so long. And by the time I got to one of the bosses of the area, it's just the ghost of the first ever Elden Lord, doesn't matter, not important, I was kinda over every fight taking an hour, and just kinda googled the location of the level 1 stone. Now, I want you to keep in mind that this is supposed to be the easiest upgrade stone to obtain, and is probably everywhere in the starting area that I almost completely skipped, so it's kind of insane that upon finally finding it, my damage almost doubled. Sorry, no, it more than doubled. It was an 103.745% increase according to the math that I did on Google that may or may not be right. I don't care, I can make big numbers now. Look at this damage. Look at how quickly Godfrey's health bar disappears. This is what a greatsword wielding protagonist with 42 levels in strength should be doing. So once again, I ask, with my newly upgraded weapon, hours of experience, and acceptable amount of health, what could stop me now? Well that would be none other than the first real wall I ran into this game, someone who was clearly hiding secrets, someone who told me he'd be back, Margot the Fell Omen. Or, uh, Morgot the Omen King. Apparently he was trying to hide his identity, so he changed all of three letters in his name and nobody figured it out. But he's one of the five people I think I'm supposed to be killing for the plot, so it's time to fight him. Again. It's harder this time. A lot harder. He's got brand new moves, a lot more crazy magic nonsense, and he's replaced his boring old stick with a sword that is way too long and on fire and sometimes covered in blood that kills me instantly. He's fast, he's strong, he clearly holds a grudge, and nearly took longer to beat than the first time I fought him. Unfortunately, because of a time limit that I'm getting rather close to going over, I can't go into a full 15 minutes of detail on this iteration of the fight. Just know that it was really good and cool and... adjectives. Writing is hard. But you know what else is hard? I'm not using that transition. Right past the fight, we find the Erd Tree, you know, the massive glowing super tree that you can see from pretty much anywhere in the entire world and houses the final boss. So, naturally, we can't actually go inside it yet, the tree has roots blocking our way, but Melania's back and she has a plan, and that plan is called Fire. We are burning down the Erd Tree, committing the first cardinal sin of this world, which is a very specific thing to have as the number one do not do, but we can't get inside and beat up whatever's inside there without a little bit of arson. The members of the Round Table Hold are surprisingly on board with this, but they also didn't care when I joined up with Volcano Manor guys who want them all dead, so I think they're just gonna let me do whatever I want, really. Speaking of, you think the place literally inside a volcano would be where we find the super fire capable of burning the tree down, but instead we head to a new area full of ice and snow, because of course that's where it is, makes total sense. On the way there, I take out some mini Morgoths with my sword, a massive bird monster thing with my lightning that I haven't really mentioned much but is really cool, and fight way too many of these massive laser shooting skeletons. Also on the way is the final target for Volcano Manor, and after beating him, after beating him, we are finally allowed an audience with Reichard. 
you know, the guy I was doing all the murder stuff to go find. And, well, murder. Instead of finding Rykard, though, we find a snake, which is way cooler, especially with the massive snake-killing, laser-shooting super spear lying right at the entrance to the room. It's almost like they want me to kill him. The snake fight isn't actually that hard. Most of his attacks are simple swipes that don't do much damage and have pretty predictable timing. He does have a grab that caused me many, many, many problems, and he did whatever that was once, but I nearly beat him on my first attempt and figured the fight was more style than substance. Then the second phase started and he revealed his chin face thing. Apparently Rykard got eaten slash fused into the snake thing and started eating all of his strongest followers, which is why I've been sent here. Unfortunately for him, we've still got the spear made specifically to kill massive snakes, and, well, it's still not that hard. Phase 2 could definitely still be considered style over substance, but look at all this style. The visuals are going crazy. I think we're literally in hell now. The snake man is a giant sword. It's fantastic. Also, I, I intentionally got hit here to get knocked down and avoid this massive sword attack. It, it totally worked. Is, isn't that cool? Like, that's... I did the... Uh, I, I'm so smart. Uh, but with Rykard done and dusted, and the last target crossed off my list of bosses, what happens? Well, I get another list, and this one doesn't actually tell me their location, so I ignored it completely. That second playthrough stuff, I got a tree to burn. Also, I know that name, and I'm terrified of it. Oh, and as a side note, nobody from Volcano Manor is upset I killed their boss. Uh, I seriously don't know what's up with them. So we're trying to find the fire at the far end of the map. You can see its location right here. I entered the area through the capital here in the bottom left. Now, the fire giant guards the super magic wizard fire we need, which means I need to take him out before I can get to it. There's also a random boss way over on the opposite side completely unrelated to everything I'm trying to do here, so I fought him first for no reason, and it was a horrible mistake. Commander Nial is proof that the one joke I made a while back about prosthetics not existing in this world was wrong, and that is only one of the reasons I hate him. He uses a combination of ice, wind, lightning, and his peg leg of death to do a bunch of attacks that frankly don't matter. They're awfully flashy and look like they're designed for the explicit purpose of taking my head off, but are either too predictable or too weak to pose any real threat. However, this one attack right here where he just hits you with his lightning-charged knife foot? Massive problem. Incredibly massive problem. This thing killed me so many times, I got bored recording the number in my notes and just wrote a lot, and that was barely halfway through the fight. If I wanted to, all of the background footage for his part of the video, the whole video, could be me dying to that attack, and I'd still have plenty left over. It's bad. You'd think losing a limb would make someone worse at fighting, but it's given him access to a move that I just could not deal with. Oh, and he also has friends. They're not important, they have both their legs and are therefore way weaker. But finally, I do win the fight, and I'd be lying if seeing his prosthesis drop as a weapon didn't make me incredibly happy. That is, until I realize that you put the prosthetic leg on your arm and just use it like a sword. So actually, I still hate you, y'all. Your part of the video is over. Goodbye forever. So, I made my way through the land of giants, where I found more giant birds, giant dogs, and Jesus Christ! But most importantly, I found the fire giant. I think this is supposed to be a horse battle, but I'm honestly not sure. He's got plenty of massive hitboxes on his attacks that Torrent can't easily avoid with his lack of dodge roll, but the size of the arena and the speed with which the giant moves means running after him on foot is a bit of a pain. Also, this homing attack would be a nightmare to deal with without enough speed to outrun it, so yeah, definitely horse fight. The last horse fight, actually, and it's a pretty good one. It starts off with fairly simple attacks that can mostly be dodged by darting through his legs, but once he triggers his second phase, where he, um, uh rips off his leg to channel fire magic and open his chest eyeball, it gets a lot scarier. There's fire everywhere for this phase, floating through the sky, erupting out of the ground, and... <laughs> spewing out of his chest mouth. Uh, and I wasn't able to keep Torrin alive for the whole thing, which means a lot of running and dodging through flames in ways that look really skillful, but were totally entirely just luck. Honestly, a lot of this fight felt like luck. I didn't even know what the giant was doing half the time, his massive legs took up my entire screen. But eventually, I did win, which means it's time to do something a, a little funny. So I was pretty convinced that the Volcano Manor people were the bad guys here, given all the murder and lava and snake thing, but there's a chance Melania's set the big tree on fire plan might have caused more problems than the people of the manor did in their entire history. First of all, it's a big tree, so that's a lot of fire, but when we wake up, everything looks like this. So, yeah, uh, I don't think the people are having a great time. Uh, scratch that, I know people aren't having a great time. This guy's dead, I haven't mentioned him, I'm gonna continue to not mention him. Uh, D is dead, he's cooler because he gave me his armor and it just looks really neat. Uh, and also everything's on fire. Uh, so yeah, problems. But more importantly, what's going on with this tornado dragon land? Well, dragons is the answer, namely this one, who I hate deeply. Uh, sorry, I, I said that about a few of the bosses. Know that I don't really mean it. Yeah, sure, the long neck on this guy causes a ton of camera problems, but it's a massive lightning dragon that I get to fight with a mandible I ripped off of a massive rock beast thing that shoots gravity lightning. As annoying as parts of this game are, it's all very fun, and I am enjoying it a ton. 
I'm saying all this because I need you to understand that when I say that the next boss is a miserable mistake of an enemy that should have deleted itself from the game before it even thought about stepping into an arena with me, it comes from a place of love. And hatred. So much hatred. Ah. So this is the Godskin duo. You might recognize one of these guys from before, when I showed him for like half a second earlier in the video. He didn't get that much time because he wasn't that important, and he wasn't that hard either. Now though, he has a friend, and that makes the fight about a thousand times harder. This double boss encounter doesn't seem like it'll be hard at first, the duo's attacks are rather slow, and generally they take turns, with one swinging at you with their weapon, and the other holding back and tossing an occasional fireball. The problem is that an occasional fireball can very easily get you killed, especially if you don't see it coming. But the fireballs aren't the problem here. The second phase is. When you get one of the duo to half health, they enter their own individual second phase. The long one I'm more familiar with isn't really that much different, he's just faster, more fiery, and, well, longer, but it's not a horribly massive threat. The chubby one over here, though, his phase two is a nightmare. L let me let me just show it to you. I still don't know exactly what you're supposed to do against this. His partner is kind enough to back off for the duration of the attack, most of the time. But even when his partner's fully defeated, I often died to this thing. It hits hard enough to one-shot me, lasts for a really long time, and whose regular motion can be thrown off by the platforms in the arena, spelling horrible results for me and my desire to not be crushed under 500 pounds of violently rotating Play-Doh flesh. It's hard. Not the hardest, not by a bit, but having run after run ended by an attack as unserious as this gets really annoying after a while. But eventually, I did manage to take him out, which meant I just had to deal with the long guy, and then I'd be du- Did he just resurrect the other guy? At full health? Mm -hmm. This fight does not end when you kill the bosses. It ends when the health bar at the bottom reaches zero. That means you aren't fighting a duo, you're fighting four to five of these guys, constantly coming back for round after round, phase after phase, rolling attack after rolling attack. There's a chance that killing the second before you can revive the first can end the fight early, but having both bosses at low enough health also meant they were both in their second phase, and dealing with both phase twos at once was too much for me. I spent so long on this fight, changing up my gear, my weapons, I even dual wielded at one point, which was kind of pointless and didn't help at all, but I was willing to try anything to beat these guys. And after so, so many tries ending with failure at the hands of these silly putty demons, do you know what I realized? My, my weapon kind of looks like a wizard hat. Like, like, we got the fluffy brim, and we got the long pointy cone. Like, I could put that on a wizard's head, and nobody would question it. Uh, and then after realizing that, I lost like 15 more times and went to bed. I'd love to say I gained some big revelation after fighting this boss for so long that suddenly let me take them out, but, um, I didn't. I just kind of won, eventually. Like I said, they aren't the hardest boss in the game. They're just annoying. I don't know, they're gone now, and with that, there are only four bosses left until we hit credits. Technically five, but this Draconic Knight, who we now have to fight horseless, doesn't have a fancy boss health bar, so he doesn't count. What does count, however, is this guy. You might remember him from a while back, where I traded him a stick for an eyeball that vibrates sometimes. He's over here now, and it doesn't seem like he's as on board as everyone else with the whole burning the tree to the ground thing. His fight's great. Uh, he leaps around with a tiny little dagger, throws rocks at you, and pulls an evil-looking super sword out of his hand and does a bunch of flips through the sky while slicing you into tiny pieces. You can tell that we're coming to the end of the game with this fight. FromSoft is pulling out all the stops here. Animation-wise, this fight is a treat. I don't need to prove that to you. YouTube is a visual medium. You've got the proof right in front of you. But trust me when I say it feels just as good as it looks. The pace is upbeat and frantic, with sword lasers flying every which way, and the danger is only amplified by the bleed effect and the health reduction that comes along with Malaketh's attacks. Oh, yeah, uh, his name is Malaketh, and like all the other people with names that start with M, he's probably super important to the lore. When I beat him, things happen. Uh, good things, I think. Uh, but at the very least, it means the path into the tree is open, so I just need to make my way back through the capital, and- Oh. Oh, that's a lot of ash. I- I- I regret nothing. But Gideon does, apparently. Not 100% sure when the change of plans happened, or what those plans were in the first place, but we're fighting now. And boy, is it another good one. Or, well, kind of. Like any of the humanoid enemies, he staggered super easily, and didn't really manage to do much once I'd gotten in. But doing so took some effort. He has, like, all- of the spells and an unlimited pool of mana to cast them. This fight 100% exists to convince people that they should have been playing this game as a wizard this whole time. So I became a wizard. No, seriously, I took his armor, upgraded, and equipped his wizard staff and started casting spells. The next boss, Godfrey, again, but alive, don't question it, uh, fell quickly before my newfound spellcasting might- Yeah, no, just kidding, uh, I whacked him with a staff until he kicked my butt with the power of earthquakes because he is the second to final boss in the game, and boy does he hit like it. 
Godfrey has, for the most part, the same moveset as his spirit form, with a few new ones like this massive earthquake thing that took me way too long to learn the timing of. He also, I think, does more damage now, and partway through his stomp attacks change from a directional wave to a 360 degree explosion that is honestly way easier to avoid without the weird travel time nonsense. Oh, and he's also got this weird spirit lion pal with him? Not sure what that's for- Oh, oh my god. What the- What? Uh, okay. Um, uh, sure. Uh, this is him now. Uh, this is phase two. Uh, listen, I gave up on explaining things a while ago. Telling you guys the backstory to all this is not my thing. Uh, but I don't have the first clue as to what that was. Uh, it's very cool, though. Uh, every attack is now incredibly threatening, with massive shockwaves coming out from his every strike. He's fast, he's strong, he's covered with blood and absolutely terrifying. Especially with this grab attack he has that does so much damage. Not enough to kill me, but... Mmm. It's a lot. In a way, this almost feels like the real final boss of the game. It's got the difficulty, the power, the spectacle. I mean, we're fighting the first Elden Lord, and, well, I don't know exactly what that means, but he's definitely final boss material. But he's not. There's one more after him, so after popping every spare rune I have and leveling up strength a final six times, it was time to finish this wonderful game. The final boss was easy, but I think it was on purpose. Yeah, it might look difficult, and if you look at the damage he does, he's definitely got an endgame power level, but when it comes to avoiding attacks and getting hits in, it's almost like the developers wanted you to succeed. Not on the first try, FromSoft would never be so generous, but before long, you'll find yourself weaving in and out of these fancy-looking attack strings easily. And it's more than just having attacks with predictable windups too, he actively rewards you for playing confidently. Take his massive explosions, for example. My first reaction was to play carefully. I was afraid of him. He's the final boss, and I wanted to roll away. However, doing so got me hit by the long-range explosions. Conversely, dodging inwards being offensive makes dodging the explosion much easier. This whole fight rewards confident play, and after over 60 hours of this, I was plenty confident. The more offensively you play, the more you make use of the skills you've been honing for the entire game, the easier the fight is. I'm not 100% sure if I'm right here, or I'm just going insane after finding a boss easier than I expected, but I swear there's some game design trickery going on here that's trying to get this reaction out of me. After all, the pace of the fight is also designed to get you to play in the confident style that it rewards. It doesn't have clear phases, but he's relatively weak at the start, slowly gaining more moves, increasing both his movement and offensive power until he's much closer to a real threat. But the first part of the fight, where he's much weaker and slower, actively encourages you to feel confident and play aggressively, even into the later parts. It's great design, frankly, and I think it's an amazing choice to make with your final boss. The only thing that really stands out as overly difficult is how he punishes you for healing, but, you know, don't get hit. Easy. Oh, also, uh, he's not actually the final boss. Yeah, uh, I lied multiple times. The final boss is a horse fight. This is the Elden Beast, and I heard that when this game came out, uh, you couldn't actually use Torrent here, and that sounds like it would have been absolutely miserable. The arena is so massive and the boss so mobile that I can only imagine how much running around you had to do, but I didn't play that version of the game, I played the current one, and I gotta treat it like a horse battle. It's a good horse battle. The beast has plenty of flashy projectiles, a huge sword, huge sword projectiles, everything you want, really. This is the Calamity Ganon fight of this game, more of a cinematic finish than a true final encounter, except for that one time he did this thing. That was unfortunate. But on my second attempt, the Elden Beast fell, and I beat Elden Ring. And the recap only took me... <sighs> Dang. Would you believe I originally thought I could get this video under 15 minutes? Yeah, no, nowhere close. In all honesty, I could have totally made that 3 hour video I joked about at the start. This game has so much content in it. I skipped over the entire second round of Shardbearers, I did hardly any of the NPC side quests, and there's also that entire DLC that came out with boatloads more content. I'm not at all done with this game, although I'll probably make a few videos on something else before I keep going, but no doubt there will be more Elden Ring content coming your way at some point, whether it does well on the channel or not. But yeah, I should probably hurry up this outro, I don't want the time code to be too horribly off from the 30 minute time limit that I blatantly ignored. So yeah, that'll be it from me, uh, join the Discord if you want to talk with some people, subscribe if you want to see more, and thanks for watching. See ya.